Hello everyone, coming to you live on Wednesday, June 30th, and I've been having some fun with candles today and gold leaf and thinking about another class that I'm wanting to do and the upcoming Reflecting Light conference that I am a part of in July. So I've got a little video that I went live on earlier today about creating with found objects around your house a little candle to add light and warmth to your day. And I got a little carried away in making some candles, but I thought it'd be appropriate to use this as our background today as we talk about the Instinctual Trauma Drawing Series. And I hope no one is intimidated by the title. I just really wanted to introduce you to this series. I actually got to learn it from Linda Gant, the art therapist who basically invented this and really amazing researcher. She's done several other art therapy things, lots of really groundbreaking work. She's got several books published and a, a site where you can go in person and receive intense therapy and support as you work through traumas. And one of the main reasons I wanted to introduce this to you, and I find it odd or strangely ironic or not even weird at all, the way God works, right? After what happened in Florida, talking about trauma, processing trauma, healing from trauma, and the fact that trauma does not have to be a life sentence seems like a really appropriate thing. If I would have planned things, this is probably the way I would have planned it so that we'd be talking about this today, about a week after the collapse of that apartment building. And I will put links in the newsletter that I send out this week about the Critical Incident Stress Management Debriefing. And obviously, even in the newsletter, in these lives, I'm not training anybody to do this work. I just want to introduce you to these ideas so that you know there are resources out there for help, that you don't have to stay stuck in really hard places, whether you're in the moments just after a trauma with acute traumatic responses, or if it's older trauma and you've hit the post-traumatic stress disorder realm of meeting the requirements for that diagnosis. That is not a life sentence. You don't have to stay there. There is healing. There is hope for that. There's lots of things out there. EMDR, tapping can be helpful, going in person, doing some work on your own, going to a therapist, going to intensive therapy, like a residential thing for a week or a month or something like that. But you can do it in smaller bits too. And it is not as scary as you might think it is. And the process of healing from trauma and being able to release yourself from that state of victimhood, it's not as scary as you think. It's not as hard as you think with a trained therapist who will meet you where you are and go at a pace that is good for you. It doesn't take as long as you think either. And that's one thing I really like about this process, the Instinctual Trauma Response Drawing Series. It's actually eight different drawings and then a processing stage. And like I said, there's a lot of research that backs this up and I will include more of that in the newsletter. It's, there's a lot that I could cover. There's a lot behind this. There's a lot to this. And the way you typically do this with a client, the way I've done it, the way we've trained therapists to do it, I was actually part of a couple overseas trips with my professor and we got to train some therapists in different countries how to do this trauma drawing series with their clients so that they could be doing this from their heart language, their native language. They didn't have to rely on an interpreter and they could just really connect with people that were there with them, their people, their friends, their clients. These eight drawings, they're not intense drawings. You're not going to sit here and work, do an hour on each drawing. They're, they're kind of quick. You want to be able to get it done in one setting. Some people will balk at me when I say that, but it's really important that all eight of these drawings and the processing step that follows all happen in one session. Uh, provide yourself, provide uh, the person that you're working with paper and colored pencils colored markers to do this so the first one so number one is a safe place number two is the safe person so one is you have them draw a safe place a physical location that makes them feel safe and then number two is a safe person somebody you can go to for help someone that's trustworthy that you can always always count on then as you thought of these safe things, you give yourself a butterfly hug, which is you wrap your arms around yourself and you tap your right 
hand on your left shoulder and your left hand on your right shoulder and you alternate. So it's like you're giving yourself a hug and it's like a butterfly because your arms kind of look like butterfly wings and you're flapping them side to side, side to side as your hands tap. And that, what that does is activates the two hemispheres of your body to start communicating to both be activated. Because side note here is when a trauma happens, things freeze up and we don't process that situation, that event like normal. We need both of our hemispheres of our brain to process an event so that it kind of gets filed away appropriately in our minds and in our bodies so that that doesn't become the defining moment. We don't stay stuck in that moment for the rest of our lives. It's not our whole identity. Now that we've reassured ourselves that we're safe, we're in a safe place, nothing bad or scary is going to about to happen. Then we start thinking of something that is a little bit traumatic, a little bit bad, a little bit scary that has happened to us. When you do this, you never want to ask somebody to remember a very specific thing, and you don't want to ask them to remember the scariest thing. So as you start doing this, you just ask for a small thing. Ironically, almost nobody starts out with the smallest thing. There always seems to be something bigger attached to that. So number three, and this actually follows a very well-researched way that our body experiences events and experiences trauma. So the first one is the startle. Well, each one of these would be on a separate sheet of paper and you would number the back so you'd be able to put them in order. So number three is the startle, the hairs that go up on the back of your neck. The moment you go, <gasps> something's not right. Then number four is fight, flight, or freeze. So I'm just going to put the three Fs here. What do you do in response to this startle? When you first see the bear, are you the one who like runs away? Do you want to fight it? Or do you freeze and play dead and hope it will ignore you and walk away? So sometimes these people feel, they describe this as like feeling numb, unable to do anything. Adrenaline's rushing in, all sorts of stuff can happen there. But you want to focus in on just that step. This sort of reminds me as I'm drawing it this way, it's a little bit like the comic strips that we talked about last week of breaking a situation, breaking an event down into little moments, slowing ourselves down to experience it in the steps instead of all at once. The fifth drawing in this trauma response, trauma healing series is an altered state of consciousness. And some people will describe this as like the awake dream state because it feels like you're not really there. This is when people would do like dissociation kind of things and it is a survival mechanism to separate ourselves emotionally and intellectually from what we're feeling bodily in that moment of the trauma. So the number six moves into body memory. There are things that our minds remember and we're able to put words to and explain intellectually and there are things that our bodies remember that because of this mechanism here, we can't put words to, but our body remembers them. Our body reacts. So I'll just stick with the bear story. Didn't actually happen to me. I mean, I've encountered bears, but there's never been an attack or anything like that. But in, in the North Woods, why not talk about bears? So maybe next time I'm out in the woods and I hear a tree branch snap, my body might respond in that moment in a certain way that I'm like, what, what the heck? Why am I sprinting through the woods right now? Or hiding behind something, all you heard was a branch snap. Well, our body rushed back to the time when a branch snapped and then a bear growled. Intellectually, it, we didn't catch it. Our body responded faster than our brain did because our body holds a memory. Seven is the automatic, I'm gonna put autopilot here. I don't have as much room as I thought I did. This is automatic obedience. This is when you do what you're told, even though you know you don't want to do it. You just cooperate. You just go through the motions. Sometimes people start to feel very guilty later, especially later, about this stage. Why did I do that? That was wrong. They begin to feel a little bit complicit in what happened during the trauma. That is not at all what's going on there. It's part of how our bodies respond to trauma. It's part of what we need to face and start to make sense of so that we can heal. Eight, this last drawing is self-repair. Did you take a nap? Did you take a shower? Did you get a hug? Did you go squeeze your dog? Did you go hide in a closet? What did you do when it was finally over? And it could be if it was like a recurring drama, it could be something you did after every time this traumatic thing happened. And then you end with a deep breath and another butterfly hug. You just did a great job. You want your body to process. Do you want to give yourself some comfort? This butterfly hug can help again because you just took yourself through that traumatic, scary event, whether it was a teeny tiny thing. Um, once during training, we had somebody talk about a time when their bike tipped over. Seems like not a big thing, but 
as they went through this whole thing, they needed to do a little bit more self-care and the butterfly hug helped them come back to feeling safe again. Because then the last step, this is the processing. And the processing of this series is actually twofold. You take all of these pictures and remember each one of these eight drawings is on a separate sheet of paper all by itself. And you take them and you line them up in order on a wall and then you step back from it. And then the client tells you the story. It's usually fairly straightforward, just describing each one of the pictures. Gives you some extra information as the person hearing and witnessing their story. Because then what you're gonna do, the therapist or witness tells the story back. Now you don't just briefly say, oh, well you saw a bear, the hairs went up on the back of your neck, and then you did this, and then you did this, and then you did this. Nope, we don't tell it that way. We tell it like we're telling a story to a little kid. We go, once upon a time, there was this little girl and she was sweet and she had brown pigtails and she loved walking her chihuahua. And one day she decided that she was going to walk the chihuahua while she took a bike ride. And then you, you just keep adding, like it's a storybook, you go through each of these pictures. You wanna elicit empathy. You don't say the person's name who experienced the trauma. You tell this story as if it's this other little person or this other 20 year old or this other 50 year old or however you want to describe this person. But you don't say the person's name because you want them to stay at this point slightly separated from the story. And then you check back in with them and you just like, did I get it right? And usually if you've been paying attention, you've gotten the story right. And then you ask them how they feel. You ask them if there's anything they want to say, the person who experienced this trauma. And that begins the whole bit of processing questions and getting people ready to file this traumatic event that has been handicapping and altering all their decisions in life and that takes over their body and has been providing fuel for nightmares and flashbacks and all sorts of things in their life. And we process it, we get our brain to process it through this art process of eight pictures and telling the story back and forth. We get both hemispheres of their brain talking about it and processing it just like every other single event in their life. And while it's a terrifying and awful experience, it's one experience in their life or it's one moment in time. And we get them to have some empathy for the person experiencing the trauma, which is them, and to file it appropriately in their brain and in their body so that it is an event and not their whole identity. I hope that makes sense to everybody. I know it was a ton of information trying to cover it in less than 30 minutes, something that usually takes several hours of a training, and it definitely takes a salad hour of therapy. Usually I try to schedule like an hour and a half for this process. So let me know if you have questions. I'll have a little bit more information on this in the newsletter, which you can get at hopeandhealingathome.com, or you can sign up with the link in my bio above as well. Love to give you some more information on this, more of the research. I will probably include some screenshots and some links. Again, Linda Gant came up with this. She's got a book out there. She's got a residential treatment program really focused in on trauma and one of the quotes that I love hearing from her is that trauma is not a life sentence and she even goes so far as to say it can be resolved in a matter of weeks and there's so much more to our lives than the traumatic and scary events that we experience they're part of it and eventually you can even start to see that these hard things actually gave us gifts because they help transform and form who we are today. And there's an amazingness to who we are today. So thanks so much for joining. I will include the little video of how to make a little bitty light with some gold leaf and some old jars in your house and tea lights like I did earlier today. Find things that add beauty to your life, provide safety for you to remember and address and process those hard times in your life. And we were gonna have a guest next week, but something shifted in her schedule. So on the 14th of July, doing an art journaling exercise about rituals. And we have some other really good guests coming up. August 4th, we've got Jen. And September 22nd, we've got Jenna. Awesome things coming up. Hope you'll keep joining us. Please ask questions. Please let me know if there's specific things that you'd like to see covered in these lives and to get flushed out a little bit more in the newsletters, whether that is an emotion or an art technique or something like that. Let me know and we'll see you. And I see that Soul Springs, you've been on for most of this. I hope you enjoy this. I know you focus in a lot on trauma as well. And you're coming up as one of our guests, which I'm super excited about. In August, Soul Springs Arts will be here.
talking more about trauma. Check out Soul Springs Arts and uh, Heather McDonald and Jenna Byrne will be some of our other guests. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Hello, everybody. I'm Jen Allward, introducing myself for the Reflecting Light Conference coming up in July. Very exciting. My session in there will be living lightly about releasing the lies of our identity. And today I thought I'd continue on this theme that's going for the conference and a lot of the titles of the sessions of being a light, of reflecting light. And I thought we'd do a little bitty art project inspired by several things. One is this candle it has this gold. It is a sticker, but um, I went online and I found a couple of resources for adding gold leaf to glass. And I have this old lantern at the house and I looked it up because I wanted to figure out for you what the real reason behind the shimmery metallic that you can see in this lantern and that you often see in the mercury reflectors behind old oil lamps. And it's actually in the 19th century, they would put those lamps in front of the mercury glass because it dramatically increased the light and it focused it. And I thought that was a great thing to remember when we're thinking about connecting more with God, about tapping into the source of our internal light. How do we reflect? How do we tap into that internal light that God gives us and allow it to reflect out? So as I do this, I'm just going to give you a couple of pointers and then I'll read some more of my notes here. I cleaned a couple different glass jars. Not sure of what I would be using today. You can go you know, to the dollar store or something and buy a votive holder that you like, or you can look through your cupboards and maybe there's a jar. This is actually a, yeah, like a jelly jar that I really like the shape of. But if you're missing a lid or you're just kind of done with that jar, paint on the adhesive for gold leaf. Several of them said that it would take 15 minutes for it to dry. And this one actually said it takes a half an hour for the milky color to turn clear. So I painted something on this one already. And I'll just show you, you just, you dip a brush in. It said, don't let it pool, but you just paint on your design and you don't have to do it with a little brush. You, you could splatter it. You could get a bigger brush and just wipe large areas. You could also like this old lantern, you could paint the inside of something with this gold leaf adhesive. And that's something I'm going to do at a later live when I have a little bit more time, experiment with this a little bit more, of what happens when you paint the inside of a container black and there's just gold on the outside. And what happens if you do the reverse, if you paint the inside gold and the outside's black? How does that light react differently? I did attempt to use um, this cool metallic luster cream that you just paint on things. And while that works really well on canvas and wood, it does not adhere at all to the glass, so that idea won't work. But gold leaf is very fun. You want to do this in a room without a breeze. Gold leaf comes in different shades, so depending on the color that you enjoy. And it, it's not very expensive. And it tears off really easy. And you lay it over where you put your adhesive once it's dry. And it will only stick in the end to where you have the adhesive. And it comes with this great gilding brush that I'll have to remember to keep clean, probably keep it in this box so I don't use it for anything else. And you tap the gold leaf on and eventually brush it off, burnish it off so that it's only sticking to where the glue was. So while I do this, I wanted to read a few other notes that I had. One of them was about Isaiah 60, particularly verses 1 through 3. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has broken through. The eternal one's brilliance has dawned upon you. See truly, look carefully. Darkness blankets the earth. People all over are cloaked in darkness, but God will rise and shine on you. The eternal's bright glory will shine on you, a light for all to see. The nations north and south, peoples east and west, will be drawn to your light and will find purpose and direction by your light. And I found that very encouraging. I actually thought the whole chapter was quite powerful and relevant to this conference and to the classes and to truths that God is wanting to speak through us and shine through us as we learn to soak in his light and let it be what is reflected through our lives. And there are verses all over about how he is the light within us. He lights the path in front of us and he also floods the earth with his light and darkness is not dark to him. He can find a path through everything. So I hope this idea was encouraging to you. I hope these verses are encouraging to you. I hope you will sign up and enjoy all the encouragement that is coming through these classes and this conference in July and be a light. 
around you. Be a light wherever you are, in whatever way God has created you to be a very special light, and let his light reflect through you onto your path and to those around you.